Hi there, I'm Graham Fitch. Welcome to June's Practice Clinic coming to you from our North London studios. And I have a bunch of questions sent in in advance by Online Academy subscribers. Um, and we're going to look today at Stephen Heller's Prelude in C-sharp minor. We're going to look at a piece by Alan Bullard. What else? We've got the Grieg's Wedding Day at Trollhagen. There's a question associated with that. And then finally, uh, a question about William Byrd's Pavan, the, the Earl of Salisbury, uh, about how to play that with interesting expression and pedaling. Um, but we start off with Jane, who asks, in Stephen Heller's Prelude in C-sharp minor, which is set for the ABRSM grade six, I'm struggling to coordinate my left hand in bars 17 to 20. I can't seem to get it even at the tempo, and it falls apart when I add my right hand. Any ideas for practice, please? Yes, it's a tricky little spot, this, because the, the left hand in and of itself has to move around very fast. <laughs> with thumbs on black keys in certain places, uh, suggested here by the editor, and actually works very nicely anyway. So we've got quite a lot of intricate choreography going on there. Um, so the left hand, I would suggest doing the left hand first by itself to make sure we're happy with it. If you really don't, if you're not a believer in separate hand practice, and some people aren't, you could work at it with blocking the, the right hand. <laughs> right hand would have to be slurred and that poses its own particular challenge so I'm going to just start off by working with the left hand by itself now ways to practice as Jane asks there there is some value in practicing it slowly uh, but limited value given that it needs to move fast and I'll be using different reflexes for slow practice than I would be for fast playing but let's just start off organizing the fingering at a slower tempo so thumb thumb again there again here now the thumb goes on the e there the second note of the groove that breaks the pattern now this fingering at the end one four five is a little cramped but it's actually a very good fingering so it, it, the slow practice, as I say, a little bit of that, slow and firm, very useful to start with. Not too much. Really just to map it out, to hear it. And to feel it. So how, do, how would I then progress to playing it fast? I would suggest uh, probably the best way of doing it would be to do some chaining practice. Chaining is where we start off with a group of notes, it could just be two notes, but I think in this instance, we'd probably want the first four. Just, just the first hand group, if you will. Now I'm noticing already when I play that, that my thumb needs to be up and in to play on the black key comfortably, but I don't want to stay there because I would have my long fingers right inside the black key area, which very tight and, and awkward to play. So come out. You see how I slide out? Now I've got to put my thumb again, this time on a, a white note. So I, I don't have to go in quite so far, but I still have to go in and come out again. Now, a, a movement in for the G sharp thumb, but stay out. Now I'm feeling when I get to this third bar that I've got a circular movement. Can you see the the, the, the way that moves, it's a wrist circle, up. Now, in amongst all these in-out movements that I'm very clearly sensing, I've got a little bit of rotation going on as well. There. I sense it very clearly between the fourth finger G sharp and the thumb B. And I, I need to throw my hand into the G sharp at the beginning of bar two. So then I would practice fast, get comfortable with that, and then the next group of four notes. Now you may think for bar two, you might want to stop on the thumb, which would give you a group of 
five, wouldn't it? One, two, three, four, five. Actually, six notes. Um, <coughs> again, rotations. Can you see the rotation there between the D sharp and the F sharp? Now here, what, what would be the grouping? That's probably uh, to be experienced in one impulse. You could even make that smaller. Go to the D sharp with the third finger. You can stop wherever you want. You can make the groups start and stop where you want, where you need. And I always recommend changing it around. Um, so perhaps add a note, add another note. Do you see that rotation there? there. So there's a, a lot of freedom there in, in the forearm that needs to be. So working in small impulses, in small groups at the tempo is, is extremely useful to do. Now the other thing of course if you want a traditional approach to this different rhythm practice, very helpful. So what would be the rhythms? Well the traditional approach is dotted rhythms first. And then you'd have to invert that. Maybe now we could do slow, slow, quick, quick. sure that each rhythm you do as well as you can before moving to the next one. And then you could do a, a group of four. But how about this? How about starting that rhythm from now the second note of the, of the group? the third note, long, short, 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 long. Whoops, let me do that again. And now the fourth note. Okay, now uh, I'm going to show you some doubles. Doubles, not to be confused with double rotations or anything like that. I just take a pair of notes and play them twice. Now there was, that was note one to note two, back and forth, note three to note four, back and forth. Let me do the, from notes two to three and then from four to one. Now the double. The other thing I would suggest exploring would be accents. Um, accent, start off by accenting each note, then accent in pairs. And then accent in fours. But one thing I've missed out is the possibility of accenting in threes, which goes against the metrics of the design, but could be very helpful for the practice. So that was one, two, three, one, two, three. Let me now do three, one, two, three, one, two. And now two, three, one. works then do the same job in groups of fours 
If you really want to go a little bit beyond, go into groups of fives. Do that better. So that's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, but we could do five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. See, the, the, the possibilities for that are endless. Um, let's do some changing of, of articulation. Anything that moves fast in a legato fashion lends itself to being practiced staccato. You could even explore slurs. All of these are possibilities. It's, it's as though I've got a toolbox of possibilities and, or a toy box of possibilities and I'm saying, well, what do I feel like playing with today? I know, I'll take this, I'll take this, I'll take this. And the object there is to do each one as well as you can possibly do it before you move on to the next one. Don't half-heartedly do one of these. See it through. Now, to, to add to the right hand, finally, blocks. Chains. With stops. Longer chains. You get the idea there. We can do some uh, f floating fermata work as well. Stop on the last note of each group of four. Stop on the last note of each group of eight. That gives you a few ideas. That's quite a lot of different possibilities. So, as I say, don't try and get through all of them in one practice session, but draw on them. <clears throat> Raja Kumar asks um, for some help with the prelude uh, by Alan Bullard that's set for Trinity Grade 7 at the moment. Really effective piece. Um, how can I prepare and play this left hand ad libitum section, uh, which is toward the end? So the composer writes grandioso ad lib on a sort of a cadenza-like pattern. So we've had this fanfare before. <laughs> Sit with that and then... Throwaway ending, very very effective. So the the notation is it's written in notation, as in the, you've got a quarter note, two eighth notes, quavers, semi quavers, triplet, 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 and then finally quavers at the end. But the the indication ad lib tells us that that's the rough idea. So we're starting slowly accelerating as we get through to the middle and then slowing down again as we get to the end. So the idea here would be not to be too uh, worried about the proportions of quavers, semi-quavers, crotchets, but to just take the general principle that we're starting slowly, gradually speeding up, and then just enjoying the resonance that we get. The whole piano is resonating in A major from the bottom to as close to the top as we can get in the key. Um, with the pedal down, fortississimo, triple forte there. Um, now let's look at a couple other th small things that I think would ha be helpful. I wouldn't use the pinky finger down there. Use the third finger and then come up to a five. Maybe a again a third finger on the top. Uh, we would be separating those notes anyway, the slow part. 
and we, we would get a much better ring to the sound if we avoided the pinky and just went for a, a strong finger. So be very free there. I think that would be my, my suggestion for this piece. Um, David absolutely loves Grieg's Wedding Day at Trollhagen, but needs some help with the second section. Um, he says, I can't make any sense of it rhythmically and my hands won't manage the passage at the speed. Also, I don't have a big enough stretch for the left hand chords just before the octaves. May I leave notes out? There doesn't seem to be enough time to arpeggiate them. Thank you. OK, so the section that David's looking at, it's rather scary visually on the page. Um, it's where we get semiquavers staggered between the two hands, this spot. David's mentioning where the stretches are too big. Yes, big stretches. We've got two fifths piled up. Now, I've got a big hand, but I wouldn't want to do that. So let's look at that when we get to it. But let's come back to the beginning of that uh, staggered hand. So if I slow it down and take the pedal away, this is what Grieg writes. So what's going on there? Let me, first of all, my first suggestion would be, rather than stagger the hands, to play the hands together, like this. And we can quite clearly hear the melodic line is off the beat in the right hand. Now the, the, the mind is going to, the ear rather, is going to hear that on the beat after a while. So start off uh, either by playing hands together solids or just extract the melodic line and separate the notes. Sorry, G. Next phrase. Can you hear that line on the top? Now what you could do is you could hold the left hand chords down until they change. New harmony. And so on. If you can't stretch that, just arpeggiate it for the practice. Um, you'll notice, I hope, that when I, when I play my right hand, I'm not locking the hand into the position. That would be really unskillful because there's a lot of tension that builds up there. So I'm moving. Can you see my intention there is to move to the side, to the, to the right as I go up. And also to come up so that I give a little shaping from the pinky back to the second finger. Not too much movement, but enough to keep us mobile. Um, and to stop us from locking. So when, you're, when you've got accustomed to that uh, holding onto the left hand and blocking it out, you'll see that the left hand actually moves really slowly. Harmonically, I mean. New harmony. Then you can add a little bit of pedal. Change your pedal. freedom there in the right hand. So that would be, those would be some of the first stages I would go through. Second stage would, would involve playing very fast. The relationship between the left and the right is very fast, but the tempo, the overall tempo is very slow still. I can do that with my pedal as well. Would work. Now two groups. Ta 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 ta. I'm I'm seeing if I can really coordinate just small tiny groups. Left right left right. Maybe I could do four groups now. The 
there's some value in practicing it without the pedal because it means we can hear it very clearly. But we must also play it with the pedal, of course, because the pedal is marked. Now you're probably wondering what I'm doing there because I'm thinning my sound out by putting the pedal down just enough. There we go. Pedal's about halfway down. Now if we want to just refer to the beat every now and again, every time the left hand changes, which is every four bars, is it here? Yeah. You could just give a little bit. A little bit of a, I wouldn't even call it an accent, but just refer to the first note of the new harmony. And that will put the ear, send the ear back to, oh, that's where the beat is down in the left hand. Because ultimately that's, we, we, we've got a bit of a conflict here between the right hand that says, I'm on the beat, because I've got the tune, and the left hand says, no, I'm on the beat, because uh, metrically speaking, the left hand is on the beat. So there's this kind of slightly um, wobbly feeling in the, in the music at this point, but you can regularly practice it together, hands together. Um, Great, now let's look at the spot later where we've got these fifths. So what I would do is to make a plan not to change the pedal here, but to do two groups in one pedal. Uh, if you change pedal here, it's gonna feel very awkward. You're gonna break, break the sound. You don't need to change the pedal until the next next group. Okay, let's just see what, how we might resolve this problem. What I would recommend is perhaps to arpeggiate the first chord, and then just to play the one and the three. I think that would make it, first of all, infinitely easier in the sense that it would make it playable. I think the way he's written it there it makes it almost unplayable. You could do this, arpeggiate here, play this as a f without the bass note and then put the bass note in, in again. That would work. So, but I think if, with the long pedals, you'd, you'd find that that was already much more comfortable at that point. So that's the Greek. Final question comes from Ray, who says he very much enjoys playing William Byrd's Pavan, the Earl of Salisbury. Yeah, it's a very beautiful piece. Um, however, I'm not confident about what I'm allowed to do with it expressively and would appreciate your advice about how to change things on the repeats and whether it's okay to use the pedal. So in other words, how to take ownership of a piece that was written a few hundred years ago. William Byrd's dates were 1543, to 1623, long before the piano was ever dreamt of. So we've got keyboard instruments that were plucked, harpsichords, spinets, uh, possibly a clavichord, a virginal most likely, which is a, a kind of a box-shaped harpsichord mechanism. A very, very beautiful instrument, not soft. It actually could make quite a lot of noise. So if you haven't heard a virginal, Go, go and listen, you can find on YouTube several examples of this instrument. It didn't have a pedal. It didn't need a pedal. Uh, if you're going to play on the piano and you're not using pedal, you're, you're, the risk is that your sound becomes very dry and not really very palatable because pedal is such an intrinsic part of piano sound that to make a decision not to use it is... It's, it's just a little bit mean-spirited on your audience. They're going to not particularly like that. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a bad idea to practice without the pedal, see if you can get the thing working without. But I would absolutely use the pedal here. I don't know how to explain my use of the pedal. I wouldn't mush up uh, too much in one pedal, and I would probably use little touches of pedal here and there. I'd probably not go all the way down to the bottom, I'd probably just stay at the top, but it, it's actually impossible for me to tell you the sort of pedaling I would use. So I would just be in, I'd allow my foot to be in touch with the pedal 
and when I felt like a little resonance or a little warmth, I'd go down into the foot a little bit. So this is the beginning. So already I'm spreading that chord. You can play it together. But for me, a, a, a chord in this period of music lends itself so much to being just rolled. Or... doing that rolling. The important thing with in Baroque music or earlier in this instance is to, this is Elizabethan of course, um, you can do the, the roll quite fast but hold on to the notes, hold on to the keys. We don't want to do this sort of stuff. That's kind of anachronistic. So hold on to the notes. Again, a quick spread is rather nice. In this particular edition, it's written out. Now, ornaments, you can certainly, we would need to do something by way of ornaments. Let me just give you a few thoughts on, on what you could do. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but it's possible. When you've got something like a third, you could fill in the missing node. Just put a passing node, which is quite nice, isn't it, there? In the right hand, you don't have to, but if you want to. Maybe a trill on the G-sharp in the tenor there would be nice. If you didn't want to do a four-note trill starting from the note above, you wouldn't need to. In this style, we can do the three-note, the note, the note above, and then back to the note again. So that would come out sounding like this. I put a, a little Morden on the F sharp and then maybe a three note job on the G sharp or even a four note. Now here, because there are two voices implied, you can hear dialogue. Do a little bit of ornamentation there if you wanted. Maybe a trill at the end there. So what I was doing... And if you put the ornaments on the beat, it's much more interesting. If you wanted to put a four note ornament. Whoops, what am I going to do here? That's a bit more of a handful. So you, you don't have to do it everywhere. You could do it on the first one and then not on the second. You could do it in the top voice, but not in the answering voice. Maybe the other way around here, and even a mordant instead of a trill. Doesn't really matter which one you do. Now going on, uh, the second half. I see uh, the same music in two different registers. And here it is again, an octave higher. That, for me, on the piano anyway, uh, implies a different colour. Actually, you'd get that on a historic instrument as well, because this register would sound different 
on a historic instrument from this register, from this, from this. Each register has its own very distinctive timbre. Now on the piano, we, we tend to have a bit more of a homogenized sound on our instrument. We've got to make the color. On, on the early instruments, the color is built into the instrument. Here we have to kind of do it. So maybe we would think, I don't know, rich mezzo forte. <laughs> a more of a reedy or a transparent piano. So it's already interesting, the sound. It wouldn't be interesting if I just played it in the same way, this octave to this octave. What happens after that? So a few syncopations here that are kind of interesting. Let me play um, here, here, here. Now there's nothing to stop me on the repeat of that using my left pedal. Then again, I filled in my third. What did I do there? I'm going to lift my left pedal. I'm not sure that I would use it on this particular instrument, but it's a possibility for maybe the last section there, if you want the change of color. What did I do at the end of that phrase? So instead of, I filled in, da da da. a trill. And possibly a mordant on the end, on the C-sharp underneath. So what you could do is you could experiment a little bit to see where you might want to add uh, an ornament or an embellishment here and there. And then when you play, you start, you don't necessarily have to know exactly what it is you're doing. You've practiced a few possibilities and something will will inspire you on the on the heat of, in the heat of the moment to do this as opposed to that but i think the important thing is to make this music expressive not to think of it as um, well this is early music it doesn't have any markings on it there's no dynamics add your own dynamics do what you feel do what you feel is is expressive and and personal to you don't try and play it safe don't try and play it uh, bland because then it won't be interesting to you to play it it won't be interesting to those that are, are listening to it so all that remains for me to do is to thank you for your questions and to thank you for watching do send in questions for the next clinic and i look forward to seeing you next month for our next practice clinic